Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about the name of two administrative meeting places sometime around the 9th century. Well, more specifically, I'd like to talk to you about how I found out about these two places, as it's a good example of what I call interrogating the evidence. I mentioned Winnie Briggs and Threo Wapentake briefly in a previous video about Anglo-Saxon boundary shrines. Don't worry, you don't need to have seen that video to follow this one. Suffice to say that we're talking about parishes on the Lincolnshire side of the boundary with Leicestershire. Um, by the 1830s, the Winnie Briggs and Threo Wapentake included part of the town of Grantham, but not the soak of Grantham itself, the, the main part of Grantham. Also Allington, Barrowby, Boothby Pagnell, Braceby, Colsterworth, Great Ponton, Hader, Honington... Humby and Little Humby, Little Ponton, North Stoke, Ropsley, Sapperton, Sedgebrook, Summerby, South Stoke, Spittlegate, Struxton, Syston, Welby, Wilsford, Woolsthorpe, and uh, finally Wyville, Cumhungerton. Let's start unpacking this with the word wapentake. It's a Scandinavian word and it corresponds to the Old English word hundred. Both words describe administrative units of approximately the size of a modern borough council. Indeed, some modern borough councils, for instance Rutland County Council and the adjoining Melton Borough Council, are still almost the same as early Anglo-Saxon land units, and in all probability, Bronze Age ones too. The idea was that the, shall we call them the leading farmers, got together, certainly once a quarter and maybe once a month, to sort out any problems and to control the number of animals on shared common grazing, because both overgrazing and undergrazing cause serious problems. Uh, the word hundred comes from the notional idea that there would be a hundred such farmers in a hundred. Mm -hmm. In practice, the number varied greatly. Significantly, the name of Wapentake means take or count of weapons. Now, these leading farmers would have been free men, so entitled to carry spears. We can think of decisions perhaps being made by everyone in favour raise their spear. Um, whether or not that actually happened, no one knows. Meetings at hundreds and wapentakes were known as moots. Uh, moot is cognate with the modern words meet and meeting, and uh, we still refer to topics which require discussion as moot points. Because swap and take is a Scandinavian word, it wouldn't have been in use before the end of the 9th century, which is when significant Scandinavian, or you might want to call it Viking, settlement began in eastern England. Before that time, there was presumably a Winnie Briggs and 300, or more probably both a Winnie Briggs 100 and a 300. Both would have been quite small by the standards of 100, so no surprise that they merged. Now, I moved to Barrowby in the spring of 2021. This is one of the parishes in this Wapentake. Um, settled in quickly by the late summer, I was keeping myself amused by reading up on the history and archaeology of the parish. Apart from anything else, the Doomsday Book entries give the bare bones of fascinating insights into how powerful Robert Mallet he's the post-conquest uh, lord of the manor, was in the area. I'll come back to him later. Anyway, overall, I put together a website based on my findings. As a result of that, Nigel Jones made contact with me. Among much else, he told me where the meeting place of the Winnie Briggs 100 had been. And subsequently, Mike Deakin made contact by email and also gave me useful information. Now, Winnie Briggs means bridges by the wide meadow. The bridges were probably quite simple, maybe no more than some planks of wood. And, and in modern times, exactly in the right place, there is a culvert where the A607 crosses Malbec. Um, this is between Harlexton and Grantham. Prone to f flooding, as a meadow is intended to do. Looking at old Rodent survey maps shows a standing stone in the middle of a field just to the north of this culvert. It's no longer there, the field is now ploughed but uh, such a standing stone would be typical of landmarks used for moots. Here's another example, east of Leicester, near Quenneborough. It's still there, and it has the words Moody Bush carved on it, clearly the successor to an earlier moot bush. This stone was still the meeting place for court leets in the late 18th century, and maybe later than that. I've mentioned uh, the Winniebrigg site before in a video on Ringed Horizons, as 
based on crop mark photography and uh, field walking, this Anglo-Saxon meeting place seems to be the successor to a Neolithic ritual centre, including at least one early Neolithic long barrow. So, if the location of the Winniebriggs moot was fairly clear, where was the moot site for the 3000? There are two clues. The first is the name. It can pretty much only mean three hoes, and a hoe is a distinctively shaped hill. That was fairly easy to resolve, because when you're approaching Barrowbury from the west, along the A52, then there's three hills on the skyline. The one to the south is the site of Barrowbury village and church. To the north of that is an unnamed hill with just rectory farm near the summit, though there used to be a windmill there. Further north is the hill on which Great Gonaby village and church are situated, None of the hills look especially prominent in this panoramic photograph, but all of them are about 150 feet above the lower land where I'm standing to take this photograph. This map has coloured contours which make the topography much clearer. Blue is the lowest lying land, and red shading into white is the highest. The A52 rises steeply to pass between Barrowby and Rectory Farm, while the Nottingham to Grantham Railway passes between Rectory Farm and Great Gonaby. Then there were two clues. The second one is Robert Mallet's land holdings, as listed in the Doomsday Book of 1086. Let's just uh, put this information into a national context. In 1086, Barrowby had 55 households. Assuming an average of five people per household, that would mean about 275 adults and children. And that puts Barrowby in the top 20% of settlements in the country at the time. Most of the land in Barrowby was held by Robert Mallet. He was a Norman. He found favour with William the Conqueror around 1075-1076, when his men helped capture Norwich Castle and defeated a rebellion led by Ralph, the Earl of Norfolk. Mallet was given eight villages in Lincolnshire, together with 221 villages in Suffolk, 32 in Yorkshire, three in Essex, two in Nottinghamshire and one in Hampshire. Now, these widely dispersed land holdings were a deliberate act by William the Conqueror to prevent too much power in any one area. Barrowby was the most important to Robert Mallet's holdings in Lincolnshire. Adjacent to Barrowby, uh, he also had Casthorpe, Stenwith, Sedgebrook, Allington, Wilsford and Ingoldsby. Significantly, all of them were ba- administered from Barrowby. In addition, Robert Mallet administers the holdings of one Ivor Torboys. He held land at Burton Coggles, Bassingthorpe, Braceby, Sapperton, Barkston and Syston, Um, even though many of these places are ten miles away from Barrowby, but they were still administered from there. Uh, One has to assume that Ivor Torboys was uh, an absentee landlord. Now, if Mallet had been able to use Google Maps to plot his journey between these places, it would have looked like this. Uh, and yes, I did do such a tour one day in the summer of 2021, although driving, not on horseback, as Robert Mallet would have travelled. Why was Barrowby the centre of administration when it was a long way from the geographical centre? Well, the reason probably goes back to the Bronze Age, again. All we know is that the remains of a Roman villa have been discovered close to the modern village of Barrowby, I'm sworn to secrets as to where it is, because the landowner, for all the right reasons, doesn't want folk to know. But Roman villas were erected at Roman estate centres. So we can say that Barrowby has been an important place since Roman times, at the very least. And that begins to solve another puzzle. Why is the village green in Barrowby also known as Stephen Gutter? although since the 1970s it's often been corrupted to Stephen's gutter. The gutter part is not a problem, as until the 1950s there was a drainage ditch running across it. This was levelled up when the wartime allotments were converted to a sports field. But who was Stephen? The 1970s local historian L.R. Cryer named nearly 700 people who lived in the parish since records began. And for a brief period in the 1690s, a Michael Stevens ran one of the village pubs. But that hardly explains Stephen Gutter. So I think it's not who was Stephen, but what was a Stephen? The elephant in the room, so to speak, is that Barrowby is in now in South Castephen District Council. And before that, in Castephen, one of the four traditional parts of Lincolnshire. So out came my place-name dictionaries. 
Yep. Stefna is the old Scandinavian word for a meeting. It's part of Kestephen, and clearly it seems to be the key part of Stephen Gutter. Now, there is just a possibility that Stephen is from the old English word stive. Um, that word means tree stump place. The N would make it Stephen rather than Steve. So Stive is the dark black plural, as in ox and oxen or child and children. The I would have almost certainly been pronounced as in modern German. That's rather like a short E, as in oxen. So phonetically, Steven rather than Stephen. However... Stephen would not explain Kestephen's name, so I think Barabbas Stephen Gutter originally had the sense of meeting. The administrative moots organised by Robert Mallet and his pre-conquest predecessors would have been held outside. Having such a meeting place close to his hall, this evolved into a later building which was once moated and is still known as the Old Hall, makes well, perfect sense. I see little reason why Barabas Village Green does not occupy almost the same space as the 11th century moots for 3 0 Wappentake, and presumably similar moots in the preceding centuries. Now, splendid as all these little insights are, my main reason for making this video is to provide an example of how I go about research. I often don't have a specific question in mind, and if I do, then seeking the answer usually raises any number of additional questions. First of all, I read up as much as I can. I most certainly look at maps, especially the Ordnance Survey ones from the late 19th century. Maps don't just tell me where places are. They tell stories by indicating how places and routeways adapt. Above all, I visit places and see how they look from different directions and what implication steep slopes, river crossings and such like have on the way places evolve. Uh, I make much as use as possible of place name etymologies, although it is important to use dictionaries compiled in recent decades and not fall for the uh, folk etymologies so often cited by local historians. Back in 1961, a then-famous historian, E. H. Carr, said that history is a construct consequent upon the questions of the historian, uh, slightly ponderously worded and all very polite, by the 1990s it would be better to think of historians, and the more theoretical archaeologists as well, not simply asking questions, but giving the full-blown interrogation treatment to the available evidence. No, I'm not suggesting that a copy of the Doomsday Book should be tied to a plank of wood and given the CIA waterboarding experience, but I am suggesting that history and archaeology can usefully benefit from the approach of judicial inquiries. Every piece of evidence needs to be examined and questioned. Then, one or more narrative scenarios are devised to best fit the evidence. And, almost inevitably, constructing such narratives is likely to raise more questions. Uh, the archaeologist Michael Shanks expressed this quite, well, I suppose, forcefully back in 1992. Archaeology is a judiciary. The archaeologist is judge and clerk of the court. The past is accused. The fines are witnesses. As in Kafka, we do not really know the charge. There is plenty of mystery. The accused and the witnesses are observed and questioned, tortured with spades and trowels. Now, I fully accept that my attempt to understand this aspect of Barabbas' history would not have worked out without L.R. Cryer's research in the 1970s and the generous assistance of Nigel Jones and Mike Deakin. But just such standing-on-the-shoulders scenarios are quite normal, especially with local history. But without some serious mm, interrogation of the Doomsday Book, topography and place names, then the pieces of this puzzle would not have come together. <laughs>